and today's topic the very reason why i chose this topic is uh, you'll be surprised that when i did my endocrinology and i was roaming through different hospitals for seeking an attachment uh, even lot of doctors also didn't know what is an endocrinology so that was very interesting and surprising thing for all uh, doctor fraternity and few literate educated patients endocrinology means only diabetes and thyroid which is not true although it constitutes around 85% of our bread and butter work what we call but that is not the case in specially institutes like this where we have a medical college so the endocrinology is totally different and since it is not known that actually what constitutes an endocrinology and what are the cases seen by endocrinologist or treated by endocrinologist patients are uh, sometimes referred to different specialties and because of which there is a delay in the diagnosis of the patient's condition and that is that leads that that adds to patient's sufferings so the whole purpose of today's lecture is basically to understand that what is endocrinology which are the cases which are or other which are the diseases which are treated by an endocrinologist and which are the patients which are the kind of patients what are their symptoms which should be which should be known to everyone so that if you if you come across such kind of symptoms or such kind of patient profile in your practice such patient should be referred to an endocrinologist at the earliest so let's start our talk so what is endocrinology so endocrinology is a study of medicine that relates to our endocrine system which is a system so endocrine system is a system that controls hormones an endocrinologist is a doctor who deals with the diseases that are caused by problems with the hormones so in a simple language we can call an endocrinologist as hormone specialist also because when i say that i am an endocrinologist even the query from the patients is what 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 are you what is an endocrinologist we have heard so common man knows only two specialties cardiologist and neurologist and a hormone as we all know it's a chemical substance that is produced in the body at one place and it acts at other place so it regulates the activity of certain cells or organs which are different from the site of production so it acts at a different place so the endocrine system broadly it consists of the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland which is located at the base of the brain as the standard teaching goes the pituitary gland secretes many different hormones and it is called the master of endocrine system or the boss of endocrine system it secretes hormones which regulate the function of other important endocrine glands in the body so that is thyroid gland parathyroid gland testes ovary pancreas adrenal para pancreas and adrenal these are important ones and we are going to deal with the diseases of these important systems so what i'm going to discuss today is endocrinologist diseases are broadly of are of following categories so i'm going to talk about diabetes obesity pituitary gland disorders thyroid disorders adrenal gland disorders reproductive disorders osteoporosis and bone disorders lipid disorders electrolyte disorders and growth and pediatric disorders now we do have a specialty called endoc pediatric endocrinology uh of course there are some fellowship courses but there is no i think presently any mci recognized degree as such so as an adult i mean as an dm endocrinologist we do deal with adult and pediatric cases both one more section which i have not discussed because that is a common to most of the systems that is endocrine emergencies i am not going to discuss because anyways an emergency situation patient immediately i mean initially goes into icu and then later on after once he or she is stabilized then we come into picture but of course i'll be enumerating important three or four endocrine emergencies where at least once endocrinologist opinion should be taken once the patient is admitted in hospital now diabetes we all know the types but what i'm going to concentrate is few things so type 1 diabetes as we all know occurs at the age of i mean predominantly less than 25 years although it is not the case type 2 diabetes is occurring in older individuals 
gestational diabetes which occurs during pregnancy, secondary diabetes like pancreatic diabetes. Now, this is a very important uh, section what we see in medical practice. Why this is important? Because it has a lot of treatment implications. It behaves in a very erratic way. For all practical purposes, it is like type 1 diabetes many a times where oral antidiabetic medications would not work. And also, there are some oral antidiabetic medications which should not be given. So, there are a lot of times patient has got pancreatitis because of oral <coughs> antidiabetic medication. And in such cases, if we reintroduce oral antidiabetic medication at the time of discharge, that will be disastrous. So, such are the cases which require endocrinology consultation. And other varieties which are little difficult to diagnose in practice is maturity onset diabetes of young where we have many types of modi and latent autoimmune diabetes of adult which is called one and half diabetes also. But there are different types. Important is uh, these are the types where definitely endocrine consultation must take place because this is one thing where lot of different glycemic targets need to be discussed with the patient, treatment options need to be discussed and it is not very simple as if to you know just give metformin and then ask the patient to continue for 9 months which is not recommended anywhere as per the guidelines. Now, so when, so diabetes every one of us treats, what I am going to tell is as a super specialist or endocrinologist, or a specialist I would call, as an endocrinologist when the opinion should be taken in a case of diabetes. So, a garden routine variety of diabetes where a patient comes with sugar walking patient, you treat it, that is fine. But when is the time when at least endocrine consultation should be taken once? So, there diabetes patients with uncontrolled blood glucose. So, there are many reasons why what we have to find out that why the patient is having uncontrolled blood sugar. So, there are patients who are on 1 insulin or 2 insulins and 4 medication. In spite of that, blood sugar is 400, 300 and uh, the practitioner or the doctor keeps on adding one and more and more drugs. Whereas, actually the reason is somewhere else and uh, I mean it can be very, very interesting. So, why I have not taken individual cases, I will just tell it ex tempo which I have seen because otherwise it would have prolonged our lecture. So, there was one this lady who was on long acting insulin and 3 short acting insulin. So, basal bolus combination along with 4 anti-diabetic medications and her fasting blood sugar used to be 250 and post prandial around in the range of 400. And then what next HbA1c is above 12 percent, 10 percent not getting controlled. What is the reason? So, then patient was referred to me. In such cases, usually we have to take a detailed history and to understand that actually what is the problem. Now, that patient had a problem of insulin injection technique. I am going to come to that in the next slide. But what I mean to say, whenever patient is started on insulin, so uncontrolled blood sugar patient is put on insulin. So, just take this insulin, take these doses is not important. There are many points in insulin injection education. If there is mistake in any one of the points, patient's blood sugar will always be high. Also, the timing of taking medication, the compliance of the medication, whether patient was taking medication, because there are four medications, a human tendency, a lady of 65, 70 might forget one or two medications. So, these all are the factors were responsible. So, when we did proper counseling education with the diabetes educator, examined or inspection of the site of the insulin, what was going wrong. Over a period of time, actually she came down to only two doses of premix insulin and one tablet. So, her requirement was more because there was something else going wrong, maybe in the technique or the timing or the compliance, not that the underlying physiology or underlying level of diabetes was bad. So, these are the such kind of things we have to evaluate. Next is diabetes patients on insulin. So, this is what I was talking about. Whenever somebody started on insulin, in my opinion, if one patient comes who is, who is to be initiated on insulin, at least 15 minutes I have to give only for insulin. History, examination, counseling, diagnosis, treatment is different, only insulin. Because at least my practice to give education to patient about insulin myself before referring the patient to diabetes educator. Because 
always 95 percent of cases that is my statistics in practice people who are taking insulin for last 25 years also do not know the correct way or the correct method and because in in private practice nobody has time to explain so the wrong treatment continues diabetes patients with frequent low blood sugar levels that is hypoglycemia now this is one thing definitely endocrine stopping should be taken because it's not just about the dose that okay the patient might be overdosed there are many other causes of hypoglycemia which needs to be looked into diabetes patients with complications like heart failure heart attack stroke renal failure gangrene lower limb ulcer life threatening infection and neuropathy here we require tight control we need to decide the choice of drug we also need to decide what should be the target glycemic control depending on age and other comorbid condition so there are many other factors which need to be taken into account and that's why such patients require endocrinology consultation next is diabetes in pregnancy this is very important section which lot of patients actually don't reach us and lot of patients get treated on oral anti-diabetic medication without any due consideration to what should be the glycemic target and uh, what should be the method of ideal drug of choice if at all patient requires insulin then what are the complications of high blood glucose levels on the on the pregnancy per se all these factors along with gynecologist or obstetrician we also have to discuss so that's why endocrinologist opinion should be taken diabetes in children of course so diabetes in children it can be not just type 1 diabetes but there are some other varieties like neonatal diabetes or monogenic diabetes these are the different types of diabetes which are difficult to diagnose so endocrinologist opinion must be taken diabetes with severe obesity so very severe insulin resistance where patients require more than 300 insulin 200 units of per day so there uh, how to give insulin how to space out the dosings those all things need to be tackled by an endocrinologist and then next is diabetes with any medical emergency requiring hospitalization so it may be totally different issue but patient is having so let's say patient got admitted for pneumonia and then patient is having diabetes also or patient got admitted with totally surgical complication like acute pancreatitis but diabetes so perioperative or hospitalization management of diabetes patient is altogether a different chapter what are the glycemic targets during the hospitalization whether it's a medical emergency or surgical emergency in, in, in case of even fitness also so all these factors need to be decided by endocrinologist and that's why consultation by endocrinologist is must in such case of diabetes also we need to give advice regarding insulin injection insulin pumps in case of type 1 diabetes or continuous glucose monitoring in case of brittle or difficult diabetes or continuous hypoglycemia where we need to monitor 24 hour monitoring by cgms so these are the cases where we have to give our opinion and this is about insulin pains and devices or cgms the important slide for this is there so this was i was talking about the previous slide about insulin pain so insulin injection technique there are a lot of aspects about pain for example how frequently the needle should be changed whether it should be kept at room temperature or in fridge can it be carried along with us because it's like a pen can we keep it like a pen and carry now all these these things need to be discussed because these are the exactly points which are asked by patient most of the times because these are not discussed in the first visit so then there the role of an endocrinologist is of utmost importance coming to next section that is obesity so obesity everybody knows cause of obesity i will not going to going to go into details of that so the, what is the role of an endocrinologist in obesity so obesity important is to determine the cause of obesity now everybody must be knowing the details i mean you can pick up any medicine book and you'll get the table i'm not going to go into details but important is since i'm an endocrinologist our job is to find out whether there is an so-called common man's language hormonal imbalance which is causing my obesity that is the common question asked by the patient now important two prototype diseases which we see frequently in our opd is thyroid everybody is aware about hypothyroidism and also cushing's disease where steroid excess causes obesity but there are many conditions so here it's our job whether it is a monogenic or genetic obesity hormonal induced obesity or nutritional obesity determination is the job of an endocrinologist then treat hormonal causes diet advice 
and refer to bariatric surgery if required. So when the patient should go for a bariatric surgery, there are criteria, so that, that's his job and an endocrinologist to decide. Diet advice is very important one. This is my personal uh, information in addition to this discussion that I have seen that many people, so when patients come to us with obesity, they have visited at least two or three dietitians by the time they reach me. And uh, the surprising thing, at least in my OPD, 90% of patients in spite of visiting dietitian are not very clear about what is the ideal diet or what are the principles of diet. So then everybody says, oh doctor, we have met and then we have got this chart, take this at 7 o'clock, take this at 9 o'clock. I always tell patients single line, that is not the reason I am sending you to dietitian. Your visit to dietitian is to understand the basic principles of diet. If you follow basic principles, then what should be taken and what time should be taken? It depends on your timings and your habits and likes and dislikes. So there is no single common blanket diet. It has to be individualized. And how do you individualize that? Unless you discuss with patient, understand his or her timings, likes. For example, the common thing everybody says, oh, you've got diabetes, you're obese, stop rice and potato. Now, how can you tell this a person who comes from the south, southern part of India or who comes from eastern part of India like Bengal? This is stupid. There has to be moderation. But then what I want to say is you can definitely, there has to be, it has to be individualistic. You can't have a complete this, oh, this is absolutely wrong. Stop this. Otherwise, I can't treat you. You will never reduce weight. That is not going to happen. So there comes the role of an endocrinologist. Coming to next section, pituitary gland disorders, where again everybody knows pituitary gland what are the problems is three types of problems the most common basically is the lesion what we call tumor now whether it is hormonally active or inactive what we call non-functioning pituitary tumor that's a different issue but there are two things which make patient come to doctor one is the mass effect in terms of headache vomiting convulsions etc and other is because of the pressure effect on the pituitary or the stock, either hormonal excess or deficiency. So these are the pituitary tumors. Why I, I have taken this slide is only for one purpose. Now this I'm going to talk in the section of thyroid as well. If you, I mean, a doctor evaluates a patient and you get CT scan or MRI done. The moment you see a mass or the report, straight away refer to neurosurgery. That is what happens most of the times. Patient gets operated. Hormonal evaluation may or may not be done preoperatively, which has to be done. Let's assume that even preoperatively patient is normal. What about postoperative status? So because of the removal of the tumor, if there is damage to pituitary gland, if there is a deficiency of hormone, how does patient survive? So it's not that tumor means only surgeon, medical part has to be evaluated. So such patients, even a pituitary tumor, clinically there is no history that there is any sign or symptom of any hormonal deficiency. Still for preoperative hormonal evaluation, patient has to be referred to an endocrinologist. So pituitary hormone tumor may cause symptoms of hormone deficiency or excess which I have described. So the excess are most commonly what we see growth hormone acromegaly where we have these typical features. There are a lot of patients moving around in society. They are not aware. And it's very difficult to convince them that get the test done because they say, oh, we have been living this for so many years. My hands are like this. My face is like this. I am absolutely fine. We have prolactin hormone excess which causes milk secretion, excess milk production in male or child or non-pregnant lady and steroid hormone excess which is Cushing's which we have discussed. I am not going to go into details but what I am saying what is the role of an endocrinologist. So these are the hormone excess conditions which I have just taken one slide. Now thyroid disorders everyone knows I am not going to go into details. What kind of patients sent to send research, uh, I mean sent to us, goiter like this. Symptoms of hypo or hypothyroidism, which are common and known, or exophthalmos, which happens in hyperthyroidism. 
Now, this is a very common everyone knows. Now, one more interesting thing. So, what I am going to concentrate today is thyroid malignancy. So, again, the moment we get some FNST report or I have got cancer, refer to oncosurgeon or refer to a surgeon. Now, it is not just a surgeon or oncosurgeon's domain. What is the role of an endocrinologist in thyroid malignancy? So, treat the functional part. If the patient is already hypo or hyperthyroid along with malignancy. So, malignancy is something which we are talking about functional issue, uh, sorry structural issue. What about the functional aspect? Who does that evaluation and who treats that? That is an endocrinologist. Titration of post-operative levothyroxine dose. Now, this is one area. There are clear cut guidelines that what should be the dose, how much should be the level of TSH or so and so forth, which many a times is not strictly followed and patient keeps on taking a huge dose of levothyroxine post-operatively. So, if it is not required, why to subject a patient to a state of iatrogenic or excess hyperthyroidism and cause bone loss and osteoporosis. So, there it is a role of an endocrinologist post-operatively to decide the role of levothyroxine. Tackling complications like hypoparathyroidism and hypocalcemia. So, which can be chemotherapy or radiation induced. So, radiotherapy, a surgeon might be very good and he or she may have preserved parathyroid gland, but post-operative radiotherapy can cause fibrosis and destruction of the hypo, I mean parathyroid gland which can lead to hypoparathyroidism or surgeon might have knocked off parathyroid glands. So, three or four months later, post-operative patients come with symptoms of trichany and hypocalcemia. Who is going to tackle that? An endocrinologist. So, this is the role of an endocrinologist in thyroid disorders. So, preoperatively, even if it is a proved thyroid malignancy, at least one opinion of an endocrinologist should be taken. Coming to adrenal gland disorders, okay, steroid hormone deficiency is called Addison's and steroid hormone excess is called Cushing's. There are very interesting Cushing's, I will not go into details, but Addison is one interesting thing. So, steroid hormone deficiency is quite common than what we think. <coughs> So, the last month there was one patient by under one physician at the age of 68, patient started losing weight, little bit of darkening of the skin, loose motions, abdominal discomfort, abdominal pain, only these three or four symptoms because patient is 68, weight loss just these two things are sufficient to think in different direction. So, everything including CT abdomen, CEA and all those things markers were done. No diagnosis, upper geoscopy, lower geoscopy, HRCT, PET scan and basic all the tests done. But the important clinching diagnostic issue was discoloration of the not only hands but the whole body. So, then where I came in picture. We just did a simple cortisol test which was very low, did a cortisol stimulation test, did ACTH, it was sky high, it was a clear cut case of adrenal insufficiency. Patient was started on steroid replacement therapy. Now this is fifth month, fourth month, <coughs> patient has gained around 7 to 8 kgs, appetite has improved, discoloration has gone back by 50 percent, loose motions have stopped there is no abdominal discomfort or pain and there was a problem with electrolytes which is disappeared. So, the point is adrenal insufficiency is quite common than what we think that has to be decided by or maybe diagnosed by an endocrinologist. Coming to reproductive disorders very important most of the cases are referred to gynecologist especially if it happens to be a lady and the most common being the PCO. But of course, in PCO is a very interesting thing. So, what I am going to tell you is why endocrinologist also comes into picture is PCO is a lifelong condition that way. It depends on what stage of life patient is approaching you. So, usually before marriage, the concern is either weight gain, excess hair growth, irregular periods or excessive acne. After marriage, the concern is not able to conceive. But if thing, these things are taken care of for a patient matter ends, Whereas, what we are also, we, we are bothered about one factor which is if, if a lady is a PCO, around 50 percent will go on to develop some kind of metabolic problem by the age of 35 because the other name of PCO is mini diabetes. 
and this is the most important factor which is not even touched upon by other specialties so whenever patient comes to me for complaint of irregular period or hirsutism that is excess hair growth i do treat that but i spend enough time to counsel them which is not even apparent at that moment a girl coming at the age of 16 or 17 or 18 might be very thin absolutely normal she would think why I should get diabetes and why doctor is talking about diabetes or obesity or cholesterol when i have come to him for excess hair growth but this is what we have to counsel the patient that it's not only about your external appearance or period part so pso is not a period problem it's a different than i mean it's much more than period this is what so that is there is our role of endocrinologist for management <clears throat> and then other insulin resistance fertility excessive hair growth acne etc all these things need to be discussed to with the patient other problems are reproc menstrual problems so irregular cycles need not be only pc or dysfunctional uterine bleeding it can be hypopituitarism it can be hypothyroidism it can be other problems not being able to conceive so lot of infertility patients have hormonal disorders which need to be diagnosed early cessation of menses which is called premature ovarian failure where we have to discuss about starting hormone replacement therapy that's a job of an endocrinologist delayed menses where we have delayed puberty again hypopituitarism or premature ovarian failure as a cause of delayed menses delayed breast development early menses and early breast development which comes under the domain of precocious puberty now coming to osteoporosis and bone disorders now this is again almost 100% referred to an orthopedician whereas it is important role is an endocrinologist osteoporosis as we all know it's a decrease i mean change in the quality and quantity of bone both so commonly wrist fractures spinal fractures and hip fractures where we diagnose osteoporosis by signs and symptoms may or may not be present and by dexa scan but osteoporosis does make person prone for fractures and altered quality of life now rickets in children osteomalacia in adults vitamin d deficiency recurrent fractures in children or adults osteoporosis in children now these are certain endocrine conditions where it's not only the role of a orthopedician what i would want to highlight is very simple thing i would discuss vitamin d which is very common but actually now of late because now everybody knows and there are so many lectures on vitamin d what i am saying in my practice is patients are over treated on the end of the spectrum so patient for same complaint if changes doctor every common just like old days is to be a b complex nowadays one addition is whatever complaint put one vitamin d sachet 60000 are you for 8 weeks or 12 weeks and then patient gets over treated i had one patient 3 years back again in that patient the only complaint was polyuria we thought of all pituitary diabetes insipidus and etc and all what not and everything was done and uh, it was simple case of vitamin d ex- excess with hypercalcemia so excess calcium so that caused polyuria and other symptoms so these are also cases what we have seen so a role of an endocrinologist is must coming to lipid disorders everyone knows what only one point here is <coughs> it's not only about starting cholesterol medication there are lipid conditions like familial hypertriglyceridemia or familial hypercholesterolemia which are being a familial condition requires counseling and also checking for other family members so if a young person comes with high triglyceride of 700 or 500 or 800 it's not only about starting drug i sit with the patient and talk to him or her and then tell them that please get your relatives first degree blood relatives checked get their report also because this might be running in families and also you get the diagnosis it's not about individual because patient wants to know why my cholesterol is high it's not always because of diet or wrong faulty lifestyle coming to electrolyte disorders this is more of a icu but yes high sodium can be because of steroid or aldosterone excess low sodium can be because of steroid and thermal hormone deficiency high potassium due to steroid hormone deficiency low potassium due to insulin or steroid hormone excess renal tubular acidosis and other such problems low calcium is parathyroid and vitamin d and high calcium is parathyroid hormone excess and vitamin d 
Now this part I am going to stress upon because we had this case here itself in this hospital. So parathyroid gland are four tiny glands located just back side of the thyroid which, which secrete parathyroid hormone which maintains calcium homeostasis. Now you can have parathyroid hormone excess or deficiency and various symptoms depending on that. So the symptoms can be as you can see one of the important symptoms is of bones. Now hyperparathyroidism is also quite common and uh, there was one lady of I think 40, 52 last month who got admitted with the fracture. She had already undergone left hemithyroidectomy for goiter 5-6 years back. So she got admitted and then fracture was obviously the, the, the intention was to operate. But the thing is there was a history of something in the routine test there was borderline calcium level then for the reference was going for calcium. The, the thing which, I, which struck me is why there was no history of any trauma, accident, anything 52, 57 okay but not such a great risk factor for fracture why she should get fracture at just 50 years of age calcium is more could it be parathyroid so parathyroid was done which was th in thousands so that means this fracture was because of parathyroid hormone excess which is called parathyroid hyperparathyroidism due to parathyroid adenoma now if such patient gets operated and goes home you have just done a stitching job you have not addressed the basic problem. This lady will definitely come back with the recurrent fracture, second fracture. So then we discussed, we talked to patient, we explained that what is the reason of your fracture. It is not just a simple fracture that you fall down, come to hospital, get operated, go home. You might get a fracture again in future. So you have to diagnose this condition. But of course, because of financial constraint that is still on hold, patient is yet to come for follow up. So <clears throat> these are the conditions where there is a role of an endocrinologist where the, the diagnosis can be half apparent, not fully apparent, like a tip of an iceberg. Hypocalcemia, low calcium is also quite common. So symptoms we know, tiredness, fatigue, muscle pain, sweating, etc. Very severe cases can come with this kind of signs. Coming to growth and pediatric disorders, yes, short stature, child not attaining adequate height, this is a very common complaint and there are multiple causes like growth hormone deficiency so we require growth hormone injections that quite costly affair but when to start how to start what should be the dose all this this is a job of an endocrinologist childhood obesity like I said hormonal causes being very common also chromosomal disorders Sym uh, syndromic obesity is what we call so that we have to find out growth hormone excess or other causes like tall stature Important is type 1 diabetes, absolute insulin deficiency in body, symptoms, everyone knows. Now type 1 diabetes is one thing where at least once there should be an endocrinology opinion because type 1 diabetes, first of all, right from the diagnosis, we have to counsel so many things. It's a very big shock to parents, lifelong insulin requirement then which insulin should be better because of financial constraint what commonly insulin is started that is either little incorrect or inadequate so all these things endocrinologist consultation is must and there are many other factors like sick day rules explaining insulin techniques how to take it in school how to tackle complica complications like hypoglycemia in school, what instruction should be given, education of the parent, all these things require a specialist consultation. Other growth and periodic disorders like early, that is precocious puberty or maturation of children. So in boys, they, they come with the complaint of enlargement of penis at the age of 4 or 5, appearance of pubic or axillary hair, facial hair at the age of, I mean below 7 or 8 years, deepening of voice, appearance of mature body odor, in girls, again, enlargement of breast, beginning of menstruation, appearance of pubic or axillary hair, facial hair, and appearance of mature body odor. And there can be also delayed or late puberty, like increase in height. I mean, sorry, increase <coughs> in the height is delayed. Secondary sexual characters don't appear by the age of 14 or 15. And no menstruation in girls. 
and disorders of sex differentiation which appear immediately after birth or later also. This is a, immediately a job of pediatrician to refer. So in males absence of one or both testes, short penis size, presence of female genital structures like uterus and ovaries in boys, I mean in a male, in females enlargement of clitoris, absence of vaginal opening, presence of one or both testes in a female, these are all called disorders of sex differentiation. So ambigu any ambiguity in determining the sex of a child or an individual requires endocrinology evaluation. So thank you. Endocrinology health lies just ahead. I am daily available at from 10 to 1. Any questions, any doubts, I am